This panel will focus on the community side of conservation, a part of the overall formula for success that has always been a key aspect in the Kohler model of restoration and preservation. My name is Ann Pryor, and I'm the former state folklorist at the Wisconsin Arts Board. I've been enjoying hearing people's origin stories, so I will offer mine, especially because it will help to introduce the panel. In 1996, the Wisconsin Arts Board was preparing to celebrate Wisconsin's sesquicentennial by presenting the artistic traditions and cultures of the state on the National Mall in the 1998 Smithsonian Folklife Festival. I was hired as a field worker to research religious folk traditions in Wisconsin that might become a part of the festival. That led me to the Dickeyville Grotto, where the highly supportive pastor, Father Jim Gunn, pulled together parish elders to relay their stories about being pulled out of school 60 years earlier and put to work by Father Winaris when he needed extra help in constructing the grotto. That human element transformed how I viewed the stone and embellished concrete so that I never saw the art as an act of a single named creator, but as a collaboration between many community elements and actors. Long-term preservation of art environments requires multiple types of efforts. Not only is the physical conservation, restoration, and protection of the sculptures themselves of major import, so too are community-focused efforts that educate and build allies. While less technically demanding, this side of conservation still requires tremendous skill and care. Without it, these art environments would not survive and our shared cultural heritage would be diminished. Over the years, uh, my conversations with managers of several different art environments across Wisconsin have revealed key elements that are needed for the community side of conservation to be successful. These include, but are not limited to, skillful negotiation with local and super-local governmental entities regarding services, regulations, and fees, positioning the art environment as a valued community asset within local and regional tourism efforts, nurturing sustained volunteer commitment and skills, building interest and dedication within next generations of leaders and volunteers, and undertaking continuous fundraising, even if it's located in rural areas with limited financial resources. This panel will focus on efforts undertaken at art environments from across the country that utilize these and other community building efforts required for the environment's survival. Panelists will discuss sites in Wisconsin, Maine, and Louisiana, and we hope that discussion at the end of their presentations will draw out ideas and practices from additional sites. We hope that for a creative exchange of ideas, especially if that exchange can bolster future efforts at these and other art environments. And our first presenter is Rich Gabe, who holds a master's degree in museum studies from John F. Kennedy University in California. His current research interest is the intersection between art environments and cultural tourism. Whenever possible, he himself is a traveler visiting art environments and other idiosyncratic spaces, which he then writes about on his blog, The Land Behind, A Field Guide to America's Lost Wonders. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am so humbled to be here. This is great. Thank you very much, Kohler, and uh, for Thank you, Terry Yoho, for forgetting that I am, someday will be one of your favorite people, maybe. <laughs> I, can, I can hope for that. Um, in the fall of 2009, I went, to, I went through two monumental life-changing moments. Monumental life-changing moment number one, Sunday, October 4th, 2009, almost exactly eight years ago today, on a vacation uh, in Los Angeles, me and my beautiful wife, Susan, were headed to the airport, and we decided to stop at the Watts Tower. It was a last-minute thing. It wasn't planned. It was, if it fit into our schedule, cool. If not, I, at the time, I knew almost nothing about them. But as many of the people here can attest to, once you get there, it was amazing. It was overwhelming. I, I was so in awe and inspired about Simon Rodia's achievement, his mania his obsession, his creativity. I was so moved that uh, as soon as I got home from my trip a couple days later, I ran to the computer and I started researching this thing. Uh, and at the time, there wasn't much information, but I did find a couple websites. And uh, I found out there was a name for this kind of place. 
our environment. Or in fact, there are many names for this kind of place. <laughs> Self-taught art environment, visionary art, folk art, outsider art. Um, and I'm not going to go into that here and all, all the different names and the confusion that creates, but I will say this, and this is a true story, twice now, when I've told friends of mine, when I'm into this thing called art environments, they've been like, and this has happened to me twice, they've been like, oh, like Mount Rushmore. <laughs> no! No! Not like Mount Rushmore. <laughs> but then I have to explain for like 15 minutes and get them on board. But I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to do that. Uh, but at the time, I found, as I was saying, there was a lack of information. I basically found a couple websites, Kelly Ludwig's great site, uh, Nero Leary's great site, a couple books, the Tashin book, a uh, couple, couple articles. But there wasn't a whole lot going on. But since that fateful day almost eight years ago, I have spent a lot of time and a lot of money traveling around this country, visiting, I've been to over 100 art environments, uh, I've met tons of great people from artists and stewards. Uh, I've taken thousands of photos. I've interned at Spaces Archive and I've done some writing for them. I wrote about this, uh, about our environments for grad school. And I make a lot of maps. And I make a lot of lists. And then I grab my wife and I drive around this country, skipping the boring places like Hawaii and Disneyland, taking her to amazing locales like the St. Louis suburbs, rural Ohio, and the flat eastern half of Colorado. <laughs> Monumental life-changing moment number two, November 15th, 2009, almost exactly eight years ago today, while I was at an antique store, I came across some old-timey shaving equipment, and it made me want to start shaving like men did in the Roaring Twenties. I, I, you know, if you're familiar with the, the badge and the uh, badger hair brush and the mug and the safety razor or the straight razor. So when I got home, I ran to the computer and I started researching this thing. And I found out there are actually tons of information on how to shave like grandpa. <laughs> and there's a name for this kind of shaving. It's called wet shaving. Sort of a gross name, I don't know. <laughs> but unlike art environments, there's actually dozens of websites with tons of really active chat rooms and forums. Uh, I found this forum here. P people have written over a million comments about safety razors. And when I say people, I mean men, because only half the adult population shave. Not only is there one podcast, I found five podcasts about shaving. This one here has over 39 episodes in the last year, which is arguably 38 episodes too many. <laughs> what could they possibly be talking about at this point? But anyway, so. I went out, I got my badger hair brush, I got the shaving, I went on YouTube, I learned how to do it, and that brings me to three months later, monumental life-changing moment number three, January 15th, 2010, almost exactly seven years ago, nine months today, I grew a beard. <laughs> Haven't looked back. But the reason for my presentation is not to compare and contrast shaving and art environments for 45 minutes. I'm taking the whole time. Uh, <laughs> But I do want to talk about the distinct lack of recognition that our environments get in the public space, um, online, and even now, there's only about five or so really active websites. We have Nero Leary's site, Kelly Ludwig's Detour art site. Uh, Spaces Archive has, in the last eight years, has become this incredible resource. Uh, Fred Scruton's uh, great website, uh, Photography. But it, it's actually pretty minimal if you add Atlas Obscura, a couple other sites, you have a couple more. But there's really no forums, there's no podcasts, uh, there's no chat rooms where people are really actively talking about this. I guess I could say the one shade, uh, excuse me, the one saving grace is that there's really no active like conference or anything like that for shaving, right? So at least we have this road less traveled. <laughs> Wrong, there is a shaving conference. <laughs> and it's annual. <laughs> Folks, why do we even compete with shaving? They, they got us beat. But that brings me to uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. And due to this lack of recognition, 
uh, from the local community, you get sites that are come victim to the, bull, well, the county and uh, city bulldozer. You get a local uh, community that just doesn't appreciate the art, which maybe to vandalism or neglect. There's no one there to take care of the site. Uh, you find it tough to find a volunteer workforce, which is, excuse me, why it is so important to get the community involved and on, get that recognition raised so that the community comes on site. Uh, on board. As you all know, this, this quote from Seymour Rosen from, uh, to preserve a site for future generation to enjoy requires that a site is made a center of pride and enjoyment in a community. And so what I did for my graduate thesis a couple years ago is I tried to merge my two obsessions, my two passions, art environments and uh, road trips and shaving, no shaving. Um, and I wanted to study something that would connect them all, and it came to cultural heritage routes. Uh, theme trails is another name for them. So that was the focus of my study, and that's what I'm gonna be primarily talking about. Now, as you see here, here's a couple examples of cultural heritage routes. They're basically driving routes or walking routes uh, that are built by maybe a convention center, a, a visitor bureau, by a state, uh, by obsessive fans, could be built by um, all sorts of people, including um, just a bunch of like-minded folks who get together and they build a theme route. We have the Mississippi Blues Trail as an example, which covers uh, historical sites in Mississippi. Uh, we have like an artisan trail, like this one in the lower right-hand corner, the Hopi Art Trail, that links multiple places and multiple spots based on the map uh, for, for where you can go to artisans. Culinary trails are very, very popular. It took me almost no time to find a Wisconsin wine trail. Uh, there's the Wisconsin Ale Trail. I found a Dairyland Trail, finally making it possible to find cheese and alcohol in Wisconsin. <laughs> now, I'm going to be talking about theme trails and art environments from three, perspect three stakeholder perspectives. Uh, I'm going to start with the uh, local community, and then I'm going to talk about the visitor's perspective, and then I'm, uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about the art sites themselves uh, the, and the partnerships that are created, three stakeholders. But I want to start off talking about the kind of tourist that goes to, uh, who uses um, cultural heritage trails, it's, it's quite a mouthful, and they're cultural heritage tourists. And cultural heritage tourists are probably like most of the people in this room, who when they travel, they go to see museums, they go to see festivals, they go specifically to see um, heritage and history. And convention centers, or excuse me, um, visitor centers and states love this kind of tourist for many reasons, mainly because they stay longer in a place, they spend like a day and a half longer on average, they spend more money and they spread it around, they want an educational experience, they want to shop, um, they want to, uh, they want authenticity, they want a compelling experience, which is why I think our environments would be so great to link cultural heritage tourism with them. And, um, it would be a great link. And so the first stakeholder is the local community. And how are maps good for local communities? Theme routes good for local communities? Many trails are actually created by a state or county for the specific purpose of bringing in tourism, bringing in a new economic uh, stream. And this is so, uh, so appropriate for art environments as so many are located in rural areas, you're dealing with brain drain with a younger population that goes away. Uh, you're dealing with a loss of job, maybe due to corporate agriculture. Uh, you're, you're, you're dealing with a community that's maybe losing interest or the stewards themselves are getting older. But by bringing in manageable tourism, you are bringing people to the local gas stations and restaurants. You're having an economic impact. So that house with the crazy statues is no longer so crazy to people. Uh, another thing that really good maps do, and good theme routes do, is they reach out to the local community. They reach out to the leaders, to the storytellers. They reach out to the local businesses. And they get, they get the insider perspective. This helps lead to community pride. Uh, Erica Nelson has talked about how Luke, uh, Lucas, Kansas, is a great example of, an, of a small town that has been helped, not necessarily saved, but helped 
due to the economic stream provided by tourism. Uh, Eric has talked about how Lucas, Kansas has brought in a lot of tourism, has brought in a lot of money. Last night, Terry Yoho um, even mentioned the fact that Pasaquan and uh, Bina Vista, if I'm saying that correctly, has brought, been able to bring back jobs. It, it's adding an economic stream. It's adding a little more money. The second perspective I want to go over, the second stakeholder, is the visitor and the visitor experience. And I want to explain why these theme routes are really good for them. I'm actually coming from a visitor perspective. Like that, I'm basically a tourist. I'm, I'm basically a traveler. And theme routes and heritage trails do a couple things very good. Uh, critical mass. Critical mass is when you highlight multiple places on a map in an area. And what that does is it makes that area more desirable for people. Uh, dispersal. Dispersal is where you actually, by having a theme route, you're moving people around the city, around the county, around the state, and you're moving people from bigger areas often to areas they may not have known about, uh, rural areas and the like. Uh, example may be, oh, I like drinking beer in Milwaukee. According to this map, I can drink beer in Oshkosh. That's dispersal. <laughs> Also, according to this map, not only can I drink beer, but I can get bratwurst and cheese. That's critical mass. Or I like to call it the Wisconsin hat trick. <laughs> Add in bowling, and there's no stopping you. Uh, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Tinkertown. It's a, it's a wonderful art environment in New Mexico. It's on a heritage route between Santa Fe and Albuquerque. As you see on the left is the highway, uh, on the right is Tinkertown, and it's, it's, it's located in an area that gets people, it disperses people off the highway through the Turquoise Trail. And this is interesting, uh, the Turquoise, Tinkertown was created by the late Ross Ward and his wife Carla Ward. The Turquoise Trail was likewise uh, created by Ross Ward and Carla Ward in 1983. Uh, it was actually Ross Ward's idea to create a, a, a tourism route. Now, before I get into the third per stakeholder, the perspective of uh, the partnerships and of the, of the site owners themselves, I do want to talk about the fact that there's sort of two kinds of maps. There is, um, like this here, this Wisconsin uh, gangster tour map was created by Travel Wisconsin, and what it it's great, but it's a curated map, meaning historians or whatnot went through and they picked out sites that Dillinger or Capone have been to, and they put them on the map. But the sites on this map, on this theme route, aren't necessarily part of the map itself, like in the sense that they have no skin in the game. They may not even know they are on the map, the different lodgings or the different restaurants. I can create a map that links up, and I try to do that with my blog, that links different sites, but it doesn't connect the sites, per se. So the map, uh, the kind of map where I think the real magic lies is in the ones that were created as partnerships. And this is where I'm going to talk about wandering Wisconsin. Um, the, these, these routes are usually a little trickier. They take a little more sweat equity, a little more work, maybe even money. But they're where all the sites get together, and they are connected because either they pay a due or they meet up at, at annual or quarterly meetings, or the people on the routes actually have to actively get together and, and work programs or something. But, but the places on the map have a stake in the map and have a stake in being on the route. And Wandering Wisconsin, I, I don't know if anyone here has, has done the trip yet. It, this is their theme route here. They were one of my case studies. It is amazing. There's um, eight, or, there's eight sites and then the John Michael Kohler Art Center all across Wisconsin. If you haven't done it, I implore you, do it now. Uh, leave right now, if you want. <laughs> I wouldn't be, uh, they might be offended. I wouldn't be offended. Uh, but the consortium that created the Wandering Wisconsin map, as I said, took the eight routes and they put them on the map. And one of the things, aspects I want to talk about that, these, that I have found when I was interviewing art environments is that many of them are isolated. Not just the sites in Wisconsin, but all across this country, talking to different artists, talking to different stewards, that many of these places, uh, many of the people have not been to other art environments or aren't familiar with other env art environments. 
I've spoken to uh, art artists who have not even visited the same art environment in, the, in, in one town over. And these places, are, as we know, art environments have really unique challenges. They have challenges with conservation, they have challenges with dealing with the city and county, of going from being a private entity to being a public space, and often they have no one to talk to. Like literally, they don't know who to reach out to for help. By building these partnerships, they are able to uh, share resources, share their challenges, share ideas. They are no longer alone in the wilderness. Another great benefit of building a partnership map, and this one of the great things that the Wandering Wisconsin map did, get this map if you haven't already, is uh, they were able to collectively bargain. They were able to get a joint effort marketing grant. Uh, they went to the state in 2008 and 2009. And what is so cool is not only were they able to introduce, uh, get money from the state to help put this together, but they were able to introduce that these strange grottos, these strange art sites are a great resource for the state of Wisconsin. And they let the state know we are a collective, we, and we are an organization, we, there's many of us. There's strength in numbers. Uh, in the first year of the route, they estimated that they brought in just by doing the Wandering Wisconsin, a little shy of a 10% jump in visitors, but that led to an almost $400,000 in economic impact to the local communities. The, another really great thing that they've been able to do, and by being on the route together, is now they are not isolated. Now they can plan together. They can plan the route together, but they can also plan their individual um, and collective destinies together. And, Programming is so key, and that's what they were able to do here in Wisconsin. Uh, several of the sites, for several years, did a plain air painting contest, uh, or contest, but, but sort of like a get together. By doing that, they were able to bring in new visitors. They were able to bring in a different kind of visitor, maybe more artists. They were able to introduce uh, to the different sites and create a better visitor experience. So. That's really it, but in conclusion, I want to say not every art environment is going to work for a theme trail. Uh, as we all know, there's some where just the family members or the artists themselves just don't want the foot traffic. There, there's many sites where the community, no matter what, they're just never going to give in. They're never going to let people, tourism, go through their streets. Uh, there's some areas where the Places on the map would be too far apart. Like, for example, I only know about two art environments in Wyoming. They're 400 miles apart. That's a terrible map. Um, <laughs> of course, Wisconsin is one of the more obvious sites. You know, there's a lot here, but Southern California, I think there's a lot in Ohio, Atlanta, Alabama. There are areas where this could all be made possible. Now, are heritage routes the key to making art environments more popular than shaving like an old man? No, it's not magic, folk. It's nothing beats shaving. <laughs> but it's just a tool. It's a tool that environments can think about when building partnerships and marketing themselves and bringing in visitors and money to the community. My hope is that in the future, when I tell people that I love this thing called art environments, they will say, oh, you mean like Mount Rushmore? <laughs> like the one in Kansas? The little one? The cooler one? And I will say, yeah, that's it. So. Thank you. Uh, we got um, early copies of each other's uh, PowerPoints, and I was wondering how that shaving fit in. <laughs> All is revealed. <laughs> so our next uh, co-presenters, um, Hannah Blunt is an art historian and the associate curator at the Mount Holyoke College Art Museum in Massachusetts. She previously served as the Langley Curator for Special Projects at the Colby College Museum of Art in Waterville, Maine. And she and her partner, Robert Robin Mandel, gained special insights by living in the Langley's home in Cushing, Maine from 2010 to 2012. And her co-presenter, Ron Harvey, um, has worked in conservation at the Milwaukee Public Museum and the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology at Harvard. Relocating to Maine in 1990, he founded Tucker Brook Conservation a private conservation practice working with both private and public collections throughout the U.S., Mexico, and Ethiopia. Is this on? Yeah. Thank you, Anne. 
Um, and thank you to the conference organizers. Uh, it is really a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here. Um, the project that I'm about to talk about, uh, my involvement with it actually ended about three years ago. So I've been sort of delving back into this and I'm just um, reminded about what a special thing it was and um, my passion is rekindled. So I also have to thank you, Ron, for um, kind of bringing me back in. Um, and as Anne outlined at the beginning, I think that artist um, built environments and these preservation projects are all about community. And so um, the story that I'm about to tell, I think, has parallels to many of these preservation projects. Um, it's not unique in the way that um, many, many different constituents were brought together. Um, I think there are stories of courtship and heartbreak and compromise and victory um, in all of these projects. Um, and so this is, this is just one story. At a ceremony at the Maine State House in 1971, sorry, I just wanna make sure I'm talking, there you go. Um, at a ceremony at the Maine State House in 1971, Scott Nearing, the grandfather of the Back to the Land movement, received the Maine State Award given that year by the Maine State Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Beside him on that day, receiving the same award was the artist Bernard Langley. The dedication read, the imprint of Maine upon the work of Bernard Langley is as clear as tracks in fresh snow. Indeed, few artists nurtured by this state express more clearly its earthy heritage. Working in the prime material of this timbered land, Langley creates with wit and power his personal images of the creatures of the earth. Under his hand, the rough scraps of forest and sawmill of abandoned structures and implements are brought to new and unexpected life. Langley was born in 1921 in Old Town, Maine, a logging and lumbering community comprising several islands in the Penobscot River. Um, and here he is as a, as a young boy in his parents' backyard and um, drawing on the, the stoop of his home. Langley took an interest in art at a young age. He left Maine after high school to pursue a, a career in commercial art and soon gravitated toward fine art, attending the Brooklyn Museum Art School and the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. He also received uh, a Guggenheim uh, to study in Norway um, and uh, traveled and studied throughout Europe. He eventually settled in New York in the 1950s. He, uh, he soon uh, gained rather prestigious gallery representation um, and had a solo exhibition at the Castelli Gallery, a really, really important um, gallery space in New York in the late 50s. But in the spring of 1966, in the midst of commercial success in New York, Langley left behind the emerging epicenter of the art world in favor of making art outdoors on the land in his native state of Maine. With proceeds from his art sales, he purchased an 80-acre feral farm in the tiny coastal town of Cushing, Maine. In the last decade of his life, he built on the land more than 100 wood reliefs and sculptures, including many monumental artworks depicting athletes, notorious politicians, animals, from the circus to the jungle to the realms of make-believe. Lions, tigers, and bears, but also horses, dogs, giraffes, giant seabirds, elephants, hippos, camels, and a mermaid. He moved and reworked these pieces, placing them in whimsical arrangements in, out, and around his home, amid trees, in ponds, and on the exterior walls of his barns and studios. Langley pursued a daily rhythm of art making that resembled the agrarian livelihood of his locality. He practiced a sort of art husbandry and articulated a desire to use the land the way the, a farmer uses it to create what he described as his environmental complex. And he actually did have live animals um, living in and amongst the, the wooden sculptures on the property. Um, you can kind of just imagine this, this image of him sort of heading out to the barn to feed his horse, Cheyenne, which you can see in the image here, um, meandering among wooden dogs and live cats and live dogs and wooden cats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Beginning with his monumental horse in 1966, a wooden beast which still towers over the main road in Cushing 50 years later, Langley became absorbed with the idea of the landscape as his canvas and with Maine's quintessential elements as contributors to his creative process. He sought a symbiosis of sorts between his materials, the artworks composed of them, and the inherent qualities of the place he made home. Langley's art was as rooted in, a native, in, in his native land as a homesteader's nourishing vegetable garden. Scrap wood, muddy ponds, and changeable weather were as integral to his art as they were realities of his environment. Langley died in Cushing in 1977 at the age of 56. More than 30 years later, upon the death of his widow, Helen, in 2010, Bernard Langley's estate, including 3,300 works of art, and the sprawling Cushing property passed to the Colby College Museum of Art as a bequest. And it's important to note that during the years where Helen was living on the property um, after Bernard had passed away, she, she kept it quite private. She put up no trespassing signs and um, really did not allow visitors to walk around the way Langley did when he was alive. Um, and she made some changes to the site. She actually let some of the landscape grow in quite a bit. Um, she moved some things around. Um, but she also kept incredible records and maintained quite a bit of the, um, the art there. The Colby Museum hired me that year to manage this large and complex gift of art and real estate, a post that required I move into the Langley home in Cushing. Like many colleagues here who have had the rare privilege of occupying an artist's home or built environment, I soon discovered all that I have just described, the primacy of place to Langley's art. I initiated daunting but what, ha what had become essential discussions with, the Colby Co with Colby College about preserving as much of his actual home and art environment as possible, despite the epic challenges of conservation, long-term stewardship, and the remoteness of the site. I became acquainted with a far-flung organization called the Kohler Foundation, which had just recently expanded its reach beyond Wisconsin, thank goodness. In June 2011, Kohler responded positively to the idea of a preservation project of the Langley property. If, the big if, a third party steward for the future could be identified. After almost two years of exploratory and ultimately discouraging meetings in boardrooms with officials from other main colleges and museums, and even representatives from the state's Bureau of Parks and Lands, we were nearly at the end of the road. But a small local land trust, the Georges River Land Trust, in nearby Rockland, turned out to be the little engine that could. After many, many, many meetings <laughs> where myriad scenarios and stewardship <laughs> models were considered, GRLT agreed to complete the trifecta and take ownership of the site in perpetuity. In a bold vision that could have drawn criticism from their constituents, they saw the potential of Langley's property to connect people with the land. They appreciated the artistic heritage of the site as much, if not more, than its natural heritage. They understood that Langley's legacy was defined by his engagement with the landscape and that preserving his built environment was in line with their mission. In 2013, Kohler purchased the property from Colby and commenced conservation treatments to the wooden sculptures on the site. Working with a main historic preservation nonprofit, they also completed transformative renovations to the house and studio, creating a space for gatherings and events. Meanwhile, I gave talks in a number of venues around Maine, including the Cushing Historical Society, to tell the Langley story and share news of the preservation project. We also mounted a major retrospective exhibition and produced a catalog at the Colby Museum in and around this time. Kohler arranged a town meeting and shared their plans with the community and also met with local artists and friends of the Langleys to engage them in the effort. Colby and the Land Trust worked together to create a 15-year maintenance plan and memorandum of understanding, outlining Colby's financial commitment to the oversight of conserved sculptures of the property. Ron will be speaking about this in a moment. In 2015, Kohler made its gift of land and nearly a dozen of the conserved sculptures to the Land Trust. In the last two years, GRLT found grant funding to, to develop a 900-foot wheelchair-friendly path around the sculpture park 
purchased a small adjacent property to create a parking area and raised funds to support an annual operating budget for the site. They rallied local volunteers to cut back invasive plants, move rocks, prune trees, and burn brush. The chairman of Cushing's Board of Selectmen, of all people, assisted with the reinstallation of sculptures after conservation was completed, one of the many tasks that benef benefited from his heavy duty construction equipment. Last weekend, almost seven years to the day of my arrival in Cushing, the Land Trust inaugurated the Langley Sculpture Preserve, a public nature and sculpture park dedicated to celebrating Langley's legacy and the natural resources of the Cushing Peninsula. And this is the, um, the list of events that were planned at the grand opening that you can just skim over very quickly, but just gives you a sense of the real sort of community focus of the day. Um, <coughs> music, art, art projects, um, a reading, a bake sale to support the local school, et cetera. And here are more photos from the event. This is an image of um, children at the site in the early 70s when Langley was there and would allow tourists really to, to wander around, um, and then a, a recent image. And there's more. Um, one of the most, I think, powerful, powerful sources for community building around Langley and the preserve actually was maybe one of the more difficult um, pills to swallow from a preservation standpoint, um, which was the 30, 3,300 roughly works of art um, that were on the site. And we worked with Kohler to gift nearly 3,000 of these works to museums, libraries, schools, and Main Street communities throughout Maine, over 60 venues. Um, this broad distribution of Langley art across the state is celebrated in a beautifully designed interactive Langley Trail website and map, um, which enables visitors to discover his art in a diversity of venues and contexts, many beyond museum walls. A small grant from the Maine Office of Tourism allowed us to pr produce a bookmark to promote the trail and in turn, Langley was on their radar um, right around the time they were working on a major new marketing campaign for tourism in Maine. And so there's actually quite a well representation, uh, Langley is well represented on um, their beautiful uh, visitmaine.org website. There's a documentary, um, and Langley's also inc included on a list of uh, artist sites around the state, um, along with Winslow Homer's Prout's Neck and Andrew Wyeth's Christina's World. Uh, which is actually just down the road from the Langley Estate, so he's up there with the best. Um, and I think as a result of this, this trail, the creation of this trail and um, the engagement with sites all over the state, we really built a large network of stakeholders uh, around Langley that I think has been quite successful. And I just wanted to end with this image, speaking of tourism. Um, this was one of the great finds uh, of mine during my inventory of the house. This is a drawing that Langley did right around the time he um, was graduating from high school. Um, and I think, you know, at this point he was interested in commercial art, so thinking about posters and signage and, um, and creating his own little plug for the beautiful state of Maine. So I'm gonna um, now pass it over to Ron. <laughs> So thank you, thank you, Kohler, um, thank you, NCPTT, and um, thank you all for coming to the conference. Um, I want to start out with a little story. There's a sculptor, a curator, who's a Langley curator at, at Colby College, and the conservator, and they're walking into a bar. Oop, no, wrong talk. Um, the gift that I had was uh, twofold. I, I've had an opportunity to work on Langley pieces uh, prior to the, the, to the environment and the work that Kohler supported. Um, I had the opportunity of working also for Colby College on, on many things and so developing a relationship with, uh, with Hannah and being able to have, talk about being able to outreach in your community. Um, Colby's about 45 minutes from the, from the Langley site and uh, you know we had, a, we had the best most dedicated and informed curator in the country on Langley work sitting next to me. Um, and just down the road, not too far. I live in Maine, and so I'm about 28 miles from the site. So I think of myself as part of the community. I had gotten a call from Terry um, at Kohler Foundation and asking me if I would take on the responsibility of conserving the about 32 exterior 
wooden sculptures that have been on, on site. And I, I'm, I'm going to kind of do a, a, a funny little thing of um, back and forth in terms of community and, and concept and working and um, location. What you're seeing is what I refer to as um, Langley's backyard studio. And it was just behind the barn. He would work in the barn in, in bad weather, but he worked on many of these large pieces. And people could drive up park, and Helen was off teaching school, so she couldn't police. And they would come on site, and also Blackie had an area set up that he would sell art. And people would say, so is, is, is this your studio? And he'd say, no, this is my home. Um, you know, so the first piece, uh, Again, having curatorial input on all treatments, which was just phenomenal. Um, one of the things we both agreed upon was the first piece that should be conserved is that piece at the road. It's the very first piece on the property. Um, the horse, when Blackie bought the property, he said, that outcropping needs a sculpture. So if you're driving down the, um, um, I think it's River Road, that's what you see. The house is set back, and then the sculptures, the rest of the environment is behind it. So if you take a look on your right-hand corner, that's what a lot of the interior would look like. Uh, there was a lot of degradation and deterioration. I, I have come out of sculpture background. Blackie started as a painter, and I'm, I'm well aware that he was a painter first before he was a sculptor. <clears throat> uh, so... Um, uh, an example of a uh, painted horse. And so what, what, again, we were looking at different things. So the original, the first piece had no paint on it. There was another group of pieces that had some level of polychromy, but the question was, do we repaint it? Don't we repaint it? And we, we had long discussions and curatorial and conservation decision was don't repaint it, consolidate it. And you can see what we had to do. And again, Scott Mosier, who's down the, um, working on the pieces is a, just a consummate skilled woodworker, um, problem solver, and we've worked on many projects together, and he's local. What was really wonderful was the first time Terry drove up onto the property and met Scott, she said, Scott, where are you from? And he said, China. And she looked at him and he said, Maine. <laughs> so, uh, he is the quintessential Mainer. Um, so again, another piece, uh, this is a geometric cow that's been worked on a number of times. There's a, maybe a less than 20% of it is original, but, um, and that's a piece from about mm, 1976, 77. And again, we ended up doing uh, replacement and then uh, using commercial house paints. I went to my outdoor um, preservation people and said, what's the best house paints to use for houses? Because a lot of these things are like structures that uh, need maintenance, so um, she made suggestions, and that's what we've done, and that's part of the, uh, the maintenance process. Uh, Blackie also <laughs> did things that were very, um, fall very much into pop, so this is 1973 in Nixon, and he's in a pond. Um, he was loaned at one point, he went to the Algonquit Museum of American Art, down in um, Algonquit, so, and, and Blackie was still alive at the time, so he was taken off his original pedestal, which is a concrete pedestal that was put into this pond. Blackie had a, a, a large concrete base poured around it, and Blackie did all the work himself. He would throw things like bicycles and, and any kind of metal just to reinforce the material. So we ended up taking um, Nixon out of the pond, putting him on land, creating an A-frame to dry him out, uh, removing the concrete, and again, the agreement, the curatorial agreement was, let's put him back where he was originally. And it's also best preservation. If he's in the water, he's not going to last. So now we see him back, um, you know, in the way he should be, and he was repainted because he had been painted. And again, the paint gives us a level of protection for the piece. And also, he, because Blackie was getting a lot of this wood from mills that were being taken down, this is old growth. It's, some of the pieces are so rich in resins that they're still bleeding bleeding resin. So the, they have great preservation properties on their own, as long as that skyward facing cross-section surface is protected, which in many cases, Blackie would paint something or put tar on it. Um, what we're doing is now putting lead and then painting over the lead to give it a uh, double life. So this is Batter Catcher Umpire, 1974, um, pre and post. And um, Local Girl, 1968. So Blackie, <laughs> yeah. 
who was that local girl? <laughs> so Blackie was actually a good, a good friend of, of Andy was. And so Andy would, and his family would come, you know, from Pennsylvania to um, Cushing and uh, spend the summers. So one summer as Andy's driving down the road, there's this Christina, but she's facing, you know, the other way. And, and so they had a good chuckle about it. So that piece is, again, in that area that I was talking about, that it's his original workspace. Um, there's a, glue, a cluster of five pieces that are original, have not been moved, and retain where they are. But she was so f rotted, she was so failing, um, that we ended up having to cut her open, um, bridge with, with white oak, and she's got a nice three-inch uh, square rod of stainless steel, 316, that pins her to, the, to a, a base support connection. And then one of the arms, the left front arm, uh, there's, a, again, a stainless steel rod that runs into the concrete pad and up to her shoulder to give it support. Because we know people are not climbing on these pieces, but they're going to certainly be handling them. Um, and we want to keep them long and, long and hard. And also the idea was um, repainting. So we found, uh, again, Helen had great pictures. And uh, I was matching off of those pictures and what little paint we had. She, poor Christine, has had multiple layers of paint. She had a, originally, this is, um, she had a pink dress and she had a white dress. And the face turned into this creamy color. The arms were all the same color. And uh, Blackie had, had painted the, the arms and legs differently. So she's back to normal. But someone, again, just prior to the, the land opening, brought some historic photographs around 1970s, um, prior to Blackie's death. And Christine has rouge. So she's got these you know, cheek, little red um, cheeks. So I'll go back and embellish. Um, the bears, and I think Terry showed a picture of this piece, that we had to, we had to, all of this wood had to be dried out, and so the bears were too big, the, the polar bear is 16 feet high, and um, we ended up tenting around it and using, um, during the winter, using solar gain to, to help dry them out, and then spring through fall, we, we put a high E uh, dehumidifier in the, in, in the case and got the wood down to the point below 15% so we could use epoxies and resins and work in place. Although one bear, the East Bear, had to be removed. And there you see the, the dry out tank. Uh, we, we called it the bear's den. And uh, you see the, the degree of deterioration on the East Bear. Uh, so again, Scott working his magic in creating um, uh, internal supports and re reattaching, conserving and consolidating the backsides and, and uh, rebuilding it, and she's now back out in place. Um, Blackie's one of his two elephants, and you can see the early original photographs, and that's uh, 1977. And I'm gonna be working with uh, art students at Colby to help repaint the exterior surfaces. I've consolidated what's original. But what's so neat about this piece um, was a commission to go to Florida and was considered unsafe, so it came back. Uh, if you go un on, on the inside, and you look along these lower pictures, uh, Blackie painted, you know, what, you know what, what do elephants eat? Fruit and nuts and all of that. And then the next level up, um, what happens when they digest it? So it's Jackson Pollock going organic with, with fruit and vegetables. Um, and again, this is the, probably the, the most intact um, hand of Blackie that we have in terms of his art and his paint on any of the outdoor sculptures that have remained outdoors. So with that, um, and again, uh, this idea of community and being able to meet back and forth, um, Hannah and I said, okay, color's going to support the conservation, bless them. And Terry, uh, you know, I apologize to her now. She asked me uh, on that first phone call, um, how long, or do you think you'll have it done by, she was calling me in early spring. And in Maine, that can actually be June, but this was April. <clears throat> so she was saying, you know, can it be done by December? And I said, which year? <laughs> so the bottom line is we were able to talk about, okay, we've got, we've got the funding and the ability to conserve the pieces. But as a trained conservator, I'm always thinking down the road. So I'm thinking in terms of maintenance and intervention, but also how do we, how do we get maintenance? And Hannah and I 
both agreed that the way to go about it was to approach Colby. And I asked, I, we ended up working on a um, sort of an outline sheet of uh, a cause and effect materials and, and a dollar amount. So we, we asked, I said, let's ask for 25 years. We got 15. So I can tell you that as far as I know, this is the only project that's been funded by Kohler and that we've come to it, we got this maintenance before we even completed the, the conservation. So I'm happy because I'm local. I can't run away and say, oh, you know, I don't know, don't call me. I want, I want this piece to be there and in place. And, and part of my giving back to the community was uh, George's River Land Trust was, had four invited events over the last two summers, um, 15 and 16. And they, uh, Hannah and I did a, a presentation of walking through and talking about the pieces. John Payson, who had been a gallery uh, director and owner and sold and represented Langley. Um, Andy Versosa, who also sold and represented Langley. Uh, and uh, Carl Little, who's, a, who's a, a scholar and a writer in, uh, in Maine. So we were seducing people into committing to a, a level of um, involvement with, with the land trust. And the land trust blessed them. Um, I, early on, I was pitching the idea, you're, you're conserving the land, we're conserving the art, and it's this great conservation project that's, that's both space and art. Um, thank you. So we're going to go from the east coast to the south coast. Um, uh, Dennis Sipiorski um, and Gary Lafleur are going to co-present. Uh, Dennis is an educator and an artist in Louisiana. He works primarily in clay, but also in metal, watercolor, oil, and photography. He is a professor of ceramics at Southeastern University in Hammond, Louisiana, and he serves on the board of the Louisiana Crafts Council, the Chauvin Folk Arts Center, and the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts. And then Gary Lafleur is a Louisiana native who has been teaching and conducting research in environmental biology at Nichols State University in Thibodeau, Louisiana since 1998. He is the executive director of the Center for Bayou Studies at Nichols State and serves as the president of the Friends of the Chauvin um, Sculpture Garden in Chauvin, Louisiana. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, first thing we wanted to tell you is obviously you've met us for a couple days. Uh, everything I'm about to tell you is true, except for all the lies that I'm going to kind of throw in. So uh, we wanted to start with that, and we are really happy to be here uh, because of color. And, and the young people here were doing the math on my talk last night. 70 years of a relationship with Kohler. They, they couldn't figure that out, but my family's been with Kohler for 70 years, and my aunt raised... Mr. Kohler's children, so he w she was a big part of their family, and uh, we're excited. Chauvin's an unusual sight, and uh, Terry Yoho is retiring because she had to deal with me in 1999 <laughs> on the Chauvin project, and I'm, I'm going to do the first part. Gary's going to pick up the slack. I did want to mention that I was also a professional musician that was forgotten um, in Wisconsin for four years. I played in a polka band. So I guess that counts, right? It. This is the house I grew up in, Sheboygan Falls. And people said, well, how did you get to Louisiana? And I said, I asked God to send me someplace warm. And, and uh, he picked the warmest thing he could think of. And um, so uh, there is no museum there, by the way, if I'm not on a tour. And the house was sold after my parents passed away. So uh, it's different color now. But the Kohler Foundation's thinking about going in and <laughs> preserving <laughs> It's a proposal that I got in the works. Uh, this is a wonderful photograph of my father, who in and of himself taught me about folk art, because I was going to tell everybody where folk art comes from. My father worked at Kohler in the pottery, and I teach ceramics. So I'm a second generation ceramic artist. This was right before he retired. And uh, I went to see him, and he said, hey, this is my kid. And all his workers, of course, that he worked there for 32 years, all my uncles, my aunt. So the reason I know where folk art comes from is because my dad used to go to a lot of bars in Wisconsin. And when you look at a lot of glitter <laughs> and a lot of neon and pickled pig's feet in jars, it's all in the bars of Wisconsin. So the new tour will be 
I'm leading it this afternoon, all the bars that you can find, all the folk art you ever wanted to, because these non-educated artists would make these environments so you could go have a good time and you'd eat those pickled pig's feet, because my God in heaven. The other thing I wanted to say was uh, I was a Disney artist, so Disney should be on the list, and I was a... Uh, was invited to go to Epcot, and they put me next to the statue of Goofy for some reason, but uh, they said, you're a plain air painter, and I go, what the hell is that? <laughs> I didn't realize you paint outside, so it rained, uh, so it took a little bit off of that, but anyway, we're going to get on with this. Uh, God sent me to Louisiana, and uh, a lot of people said I was sent there to save uh, Kenny Hill's site. I, I think I was sent there for all my sins going to all those bars in Wisconsin, but uh, if you look at this map of Louisiana, we're an hour and a half south of New Orleans. Nobody goes an hour and a half south of New Orleans, so Terry Ojo's first trip to Louisiana was certainly an eye-opening experience, and uh, when I uh, happened to find, this, well, this is another story, I, I got to throw this in. Uh, I didn't know if I should use Mr. Kohler's name or Terry's. I thought, you know, you're going to get in trouble. CNN did a report that when Elvis died, there was a Kohler toilet in the bathroom. This is just, it's not, we don't know if it's true or not, and it's CNN, so. Uh, and the, the, the saying was, what a way to go. Do you believe that? See, that's where you... Uh, I also have uh, this Elvis thing that I do, so um, this is not Chauvin, by the way. This is uh, another building, but Kenny Hill was a bricklayer, spent 12 years building a garden that I, as an artist or an educator, could never have done. He did it on rented land. I, Mr. Gary here introduced me to the site, and I said, what the hell is this? What? I had discovered with Mr. Gary an unknown artist that had built an amazing thing. Came back the next week. I'm one of the only people I know that has talked with Kenny Hill. And I have dedicated 20 years of my life to the preservation of this garden because I said, Kenny, uh, what do you want me to learn from this garden? Kenny said, whatever you bring with you, you will help you learn from this place. Okay, I thought, wow, that's pretty high end. And I said, uh, you know, you don't have any money. Have you ever sold a piece of artwork? Here you go, guys. If I sell a piece of artwork for money, I lose my ability to create. How could you not dedicate your life to preserving something? The man was evicted. He walked away. I just happened to walk into the picture. I knew the family. And I, they gave me three weeks to find someone to pay $13,000 to buy the sculpture garden. I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> I can buy that. Uh, little did I know I could have retired if I would have bought it and sold it all. Luckily, I called this place called the Kohler Art Center because I knew Ruth had done sites around Wisconsin. And I, as a growing teenager working at the Kohler plant, knew that artists were there and they believed in this. So I said, well, I got a folk artist. <laughs> they said, yeah, sure, send me some images, you know. And Terry had just kind of got on board. And uh, she came down with a crew, was excited as she can get. I mean, she just was so thrilled to see this. And they went back and said, we're going to preserve this site in southern Louisiana. I was the translator for the conversations because when you say all y'all, Terry's going, what did they say? <laughs> you know, so he, I was the Kohler guy that was in Louisiana. For a year, I cut the grass. One day, uh, uh, we, we went inside the home, and it said, anyone who comes here will be cursed. So, of course, I wear a black chicken foot just in case. I talked to a voodoo lady. She said, no man who makes religious work can curse a property. I was telling the story this morning. I went back to cut the grass. There's a giant water moccasin heading for me, thinking that's the curse. I had a weed eater and a chicken foot, but uh, after that, nothing happened. And we've talked about problems with uh, people damaging things. There's a lot of religious articles on this, and so a lot of people have honored that down the bayou. 
And he built this for people to come and learn about it. So we have embellished the community to make this theirs, along with Nickel State University. And, and uh, that's Kenny. I, I'm the fat guy. <laughs> that's Kenny in one of his statues. He did amazing statues of himself. And so now Mr. Gary's going to tell you a little bit about some of the insane things we've done over the last 20 years. We never ask for permission, by the way, so it's a lot easier to get things done. But uh, Paul James was our first president. He was uh, uh, enthusiastic. He said, we need a consultant. We need docents. We need a festival. Um, we need all of these. We need a master plan. I go, OK. So he ended up developing that. We developed a board. We got a bunch of crazy people like all of you saying, would you like to be on the board and help us out? And they went, yeah. So that's how this all came about. And we've been running that, you know, when you say come up with a plan, um, it's kind of like my school when they said, the plan for computer replacement is there is no plan. So that's kind of the way we run Showvent. We just kind of make it up as we go. And Terry has been down a number of times to support us. And Ruth brought my mother down to celebrate the initiation of this site to the university. And without Kohler, none of this would happen. And so I kind of think in my years of service as a bathtub inspector in the enamel plant may have had something to do with this. So I'm going to give it to Gary and let him tell you the good stuff. So thanks. Thanks, Dennis. It's great to be here. And as Dennis uh, started saying, you know, we created a board. We call that board the Friends of the Showman Sculpture Garden. And over the years, uh, we've met probably quarterly. Some of the people in the board have changed, but some of them have stayed the same. And I think that's one of the lessons, that you hook into a group of people that care enough to remain year after year. Even Terry was here early on. She helped us out, and uh, Terry's always been willing to come and give us advice and send consultants our way, and so there's been not just a, a drop-off relationship, but a long-term relationship between us and, and the Kohler Foundation, so we appreciate that. Another thing that we tried to do with our board was we tried to create a diverse board, and maybe that's some of what our message is today, you know, what, what was our dream team? Well, some of the people that we had on the dream team were folks that cared about this event. And we tapped into this event, which is called the Blessing of the Fleet in Chauvin, but now it's the Chauvin Folk Art Festival and the Blessing of the Fleet. Chauvin was already doing the Blessing of the Fleet in April, and we said, man, we, ought to we gotta tap into that. People are coming to, to Chauvin already. It's only about 2,000 people. We're gonna have a celebration on our site on the same day as the Blessing of the Fe Fleet. So we, ma we made that happen. We invite a lot of the uh, Homa's Indians to come and, and other artists, local artists. So we show off the site, the Chauvin Sculpture site. We also tap into the local culture and we also show off local artists. Some of the help to do that came from being able to, to count on people from the community that were able to, to work with us. So now the community comes to our site to be able to see this event of the blessing of the fleet. This is another Homa's Indian artist, Mr. Ivy Billiot. And so now these guys kind of count on coming to our spot. It was a way to integrate them into our sculpture site, even though uh, they didn't start out being a part of our sculpture site. So during the festival, that's our, that's our biggest thing that we do each year. And some of that came about because we had local people from Chauvin on our board, like Dati Ratliff. You saw some of her work last night and what me and Dennis presented. Dot T has allowed us to tap into things that go on in the bayou, this is Bayou Petit Caillou, like the paddle trip. They created this paddle trip to pass by the garden right before the blessing of the fleet. And so now this is a trick that we did to make the, the community sort of need us. We needed them, but we tricked them into thinking that they need us, and, and it seems to work pretty well. And Nichols, Nichols uh, uh, is part of this. We bring our boat and we give people rides on the bayou and this is one of those things where I don't ask permission from the university to do it because I, I'm not sure they want us to have a, a bunch of strangers on the boat, but we do it anyway and Terry and Bill have been on that boat. 
and we make it work. Another thing that we do besides those community events is we bring students, young students, to, to the garden. And we do this by teaching them environmental art. Since we're right on the bayou, it's a perfect place to talk about the ecology of Chauvin and the coast, introduce them to art at the same time that we introduce them to, to the ecology of that place. And so uh, you might have seen some fish prints on my shirt yesterday. That's one of our tricks, make students look at the uh, sort of the biological art in a fish print. And, and then we bring them into the garden and, the, and they take part in some of the stewardship of the garden. And that's because we have a board member named Mike Slage. So he was a local artist that taught so we have community people that are, that are local Chauvin people. We also have art educators, and that works. And the other thing that we've added to our board is university faculty, not just from Nichols, which is where I work, but also from Southeastern Louisiana University. That's where Dennis is, and LSU. And so we have some of our board members, the art faculty, are able to come and give talks and so that we can do academic things at the site as well as community events. And if the university knows that you're doing something academic, bringing a class, and I can say that that's why I'm going to Chauvin. I'm not going to Chauvin just because I care about the, the garden, which I do, but I'm bringing a class there, then the university is much more apt to, to understand that it's, a, it's an asset. So we think that's part of the, the, the winning formula. Now, when I bring students to Chauvin, there's more of a story there, and, and I, I, I see this thread coming through some of the, the, these other sites, and that is the community is a story in itself. And in Chauvin, there's real hard-working shrimpers that you just don't see in my town of Thibodeau, up north, in, in downtown New Orleans. You don't see people that are connected to the land like this. And I feel like it's my obligation not only to show students the sculpture garden, but to introduce them to the real working coast of Louisiana. They meet people like Mr. Terry LaPerouse, who even though he was on oxygen, was able to give us a, a tour of his shrimp drying platform. And one of the worrisome trends is that we're losing coast in Louisiana. Coastal erosion in Louisiana is not just happening on the beaches, but in the marshes. Now Chauvin is right about up here, and so we're in the danger zone. And that's part of the story. That's why I bring students to, to Chauvin. To not just look at coastal land loss as a red part of the map, like data driven, but to show them what we lose when we lose coastal Louisiana. We lose community, a, pe uh, a people, and a tradition. And in this case, a beautiful sculpture site. Uh, but we're not gonna let that happen. So uh, brace yourselves, because this is a little scary. But this doesn't happen very often. But about once a year, we get water in the garden. And it's coming in straight from the bayou. This is by Petit Caillou. This doesn't happen every day. And when Terry visited, that was one day that we had a huge big rainstorm. And this worries us. And so this reminds us of the work that we have to do. This is some of our challenge. But there's good news in that Chauvin has recently put in a floodgate that is supposed to keep this water out. And these high water events don't happen very often, and we think that there's several strategies that we can do in the future to increase drainage and, and to keep the water out. So, so that's what we're working on. So the last thing that I wanted to tell you is that you're invited to come visit us. We would love to have you down there. If you come in April, you can see that Chauvin Folk Art Festival and the Blessing of the Fleet. But if you come any day of the week, we would just love to have you. And sometimes it's nicer to see the garden on a quiet day. Thanks for your attention. So what are your stories? What are your questions? What are your experiences of, as Hannah said, heartbreak, compromise, and victory? <laughs> um, or what questions do you have for any of our panelists about their experiences in building community and, and uh, using build, um, community assets to maintain and thrive in these environments? If you want to raise your hand, I'll bring you the mic. If you could introduce yourself before. Thank you. People know you, but if <laughs> in general. Who is that woman? <laughs> Terry from Color Foundation. Um, Hannah and Ron really, I think, wove the story well of what happened at the Langley site, but what I have to share is we view that when we sit in the office and, and 
rehash what's been done, the most difficult project, not technically, but personality-wise, because we were working with a land trust who did not speak our language. And the language differential was a lot greater than it was going down to the bayou. Um, the land trust talked about invasive species. And they talked about what material are you going to use on those, those paths through the trails. And we could not get them to focus on the art. So years later, now they regret that they didn't keep more of the art on the property. And we regret it too, but our mission was to preserve the art. And because of that, Susan Kelly worked to place those 3,000 pieces with Hannah um, across the state of Maine. And some of the best pieces came to Wisconsin. So hopefully you'll be here to see them. But in, within the community uh, that we work with, not everybody has the same vision that we do. And not everybody sees it the same way. And the land trust was probably the biggest lesson for us because their whole vision was in a different universe than ours. Thankfully, we've seen them come around, but it took this many years. I'm Sister Carolyn Cauley, and my first teaching assignment was Dickieville, Wisconsin, where the great shrines are. Did Kohler take that on, or was it studied and not at this time? It's a phenomenal place, but I didn't know what happened. We, we Terry, do you want to speak from here? We help and counsel at Dickieville. In fact, I was just on the phone probably a week ago with Arlene. Um, the, the diocese is probably not the easiest customer in the way that the Dickieville Grotto is intertwined with the church and church property and the cemetery. I don't know that we'd ever be able to acquire it, but we've given them grants, we send expertise, and we try to counsel them whenever we can. But if the church wants to give it to us, we'd take it. <laughs> Um, uh, and more of an observation, um, Randy Vick from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I, um, uh, yesterday I was really impressed by the, you know, the very serious, important work about conservation, the science, and everything. But, and, and then this morning I got a little nervous with the sort of uh, tourism, uh, chamber of commerce sort of thing. It's like, ooh. Um, but then uh, the sort of the wave of sort of the folk humor, the hucksterism, um, uh, the flim flam qualities um, that were really part of the spirit of many of these makers. I mean, you know, unlike you know Dubuffet's notion of you know silence and secrecy and solitude. I mean, when you put something out on the front lawn, um, you want the people to come, and so um, I think that in some ways uh, that piece is as important to preserve. Um, as the the objects themselves, so it's a sort of that sort of a spirit, and, and it seems like it's coming through in a number of ways um, mm. from what people said today. Interesting observation. Thank you. Oh. I'm Sam Gatmeyer with the John Michael Cole Art Center. I'd be curious to know if any of you had. Um, points of contention with neighbors, with people who lived adjacent to the properties, and what strategies you used to overcome that? We've had, we've had some, uh, some issues. We've had, we've had a few issues. Uh, some of them were good and bad, but uh, like when we have our festival, uh, there's not a lot of parking around there, and so uh, some of the neighbors got mad about that. And the next year, we cordoned off an area for those people that had uh, complained. This is VIP parking for the Neals, for the Neal family. So <laughs> we tried to nip that in the bud. But, but then on the other side of that, sometimes those same neighbors um, walk up and they do the tours themselves for us. So uh, we think we have kind of a working relationship with it. it it's not something that you can ignore because we, we can see how we can rub people the wrong way. Even though South Louisiana seems like a small place, in Chauvin, they see us as those people from Thibodeau, from the university, coming down here and uh, doing, having a party. It, so we, we try to stray away from that as much as possible and, and make them part of the show. 
Is this on? Can you hear yeah. me? Okay. Um, there was, so Mainers are very private, um, but also I, I think if you stay out of bi my business, I'll stay out of your business. <laughs> um, and so there wasn't really a great deal of um, tension in the community around this project. There was uh, one neighbor right adjacent in, in actually a very tiny little piece of land that was pretty much carved out of the Langley property. Um, and the, the elderly couple that lived there had had actually lived there even longer than the Langleys. So they had been there through his entire um, sort of takeover of the site. And I think they had a very um, uh, amicable relationship during that time. And that couple, um, the, the, um, the gentleman actually passed away a couple of years ago. And his, uh, his widow, Tessie, um, you know, we were neighborly with them, and they, they I think, through the entire thing, were, were just very respectful and very understanding. And she, um, just a couple of years ago, actually moved into a uh, assisted living facility, and um, the, I mentioned that the land trust bought a, bought a piece of land, and, and it was actually that little plot of land that they purchased, and they auctioned the house off, and that was what created the parking area for the site. And so it all, it all kind of worked out, um, I think, very well. Uh, in that instance. So, um, more of a comment um, and, on- And introduce yourself. Oh, Kevin Rose, thank you, uh, with the Hartman Rock Garden in Springfield, Ohio. Uh, more of a comment, playing off what we're talking about here, I think we need to find better ways of first connecting our sites. Uh, so the sites especially that have boards and maybe staff or whatever that might be are talking more together. Uh, but as it relates to this session, I think we need to be doing more to connect our communities and the people in our communities. In Springfield, Ohio, we have a, a chamber of commerce that really gets it, and they believe in preservation, historic preservation, and we've struggled with this for 10, 15 years, but what we've been doing lately is taking community leaders and taking them to, to towns that get it, and just taking them there, going out to dinner, talking to community leaders, and when we get back to our town, we find that our mayor, our city manager, the heads of our foundations, universities, they get it. Um, and we're making huge progress. And I think if I could go back to our site, if we could have, if we would have had the, the knowledge to get a group of community leaders and to come up here to Wisconsin and go to a community that they really get it, they understand how important this art environment is to their community, is to our heritage, to our, to our art culture. And I think we would go back and we would have much better luck in our community. We have it today. It's taken us however many years, eight years to start to get there. But I, I wish I had the key leaders of my community here because mm. we would go back and we would have a much easier fundraising time at fundraising, connecting the disparate parts of our community if they could see the great success stories that have happened across the country. So I think we need to find ways of doing that, of, of collaborating, working together. That's a great idea. and. We need to remember that that leadership shifts and interests in communities shift, and so you have to time it well. Yeah. Who's next? I have a question, okay. Karen, with the um, John Michael Kohler Art Center. My question is for you, Hannah. Um, a curatorial advice and advisement on the restoration and preservation of art environments really stretches a lot of muscles <laughs> that you may not be used to, and I totally understand that. So. I live with that a lot, and I struggle with the decisions that I make, and I'm very self-conscious sometimes about, did I make the right choice? What is, how far is too far? Those kinds of questions, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about being the curatorial voice in that restoration project. Sure. Um, oh, it, was, it was so vast that it's hard to kind of sort, it, it's hard to pull out specific <laughs> examples. Um, but I would say, you know, as, as Ron, as Ron sort of described, I mean, I think I, I wasn't alone in it. You know, I had I had a, a professional conservator. Uh, you know, kind of, it was a back and forth between both of us. And um, I think that the I, I have to I have to be I'm, I'm grateful to Helen Langley too for all of the records that she kept because in many cases it, it kind of gave me the answers um, to be able to go back and see the placement of things. Um, and their original paint and their, you know, their original. I mean, Langley 
Langley moved things around um, in his, he, he repaired things, you know, things started to degrade even, to degrade even when he was still alive. Um, there was one whole enormous composition on the front lawn that he actually dismantled several years after creating and integrated parts of it around the property. So it was a very dynamic um, place all along and, and continued to be dynamic as Helen made choices of where she wanted to see things. So there was never, it, there, there's no time capsule moment. Um, and so that was also a little bit liberating, you know, you, you could kind of pick and choose. Um, but there were certainly a few, you know, I, I think particularly around the painting of, of sculptures. I think um, many, many of the people who had had the experience of, of seeing the sculptures on the site had this very specific image of them. And it's kind of like the way we look at um, ancient sculpture, you know? I mean, that, that used to be brilliantly painted and our understanding of it is that it's this very stark white. Um, and I think that was, it was kind of a similar experience for people when they saw the repainted sculptures that it was a little bit sort of garish and that's that's actually really how they originally looked and so bringing that back to some extent was um, was important I think to kind of resurrecting Langley's Langley's vision there so just a few comments we probably one last question and then we'll we'll have to break okay hi um <coughs> Peter Tukovsky from Los Angeles. And um, Rich, I wanted to ask you, why not like Mount Rushmore? <laughs> and maybe, maybe we're better served by drawing connections between other kinds of artwork than try, constantly trying to remind people of differences. Th that's actually a good point. And you know, when the, uh, the, I've actually never been to Mount Rushmore. Oh, only the one in Kansas. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, no, I have nothing against Mount Rushmore, but it's just, it, it's interesting. I, to me, our environments are so d distinctive um, and so unique that to, to get that word across, uh, that they are, s I, I'm not coming from an art perspective, an art historian perspective, but I think there's something, there's something so unique and special about them. But yeah, you know, um, one of the things that theme routes do, like through dispersal, it, you can wing public art together, you know, Mount Rushmore to, is there another site in the Black Hills or something that I may be not aware of? And you make that distinction, not that distinction, but you can make a connection. If you like Mount Rushmore, there's more public art. It's a little different, uh, but give it a shot, you know. But yeah, no, I'm not opposed to Mount Rushmore. Uh, <laughs> I just haven't been there yet. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, one thing I want to say. I, I met the rhinestone cowboy nephews in the building and they said we came from Mississippi because it was we went to see the building because we never talked to our uncle and the building was in Wisconsin and we spent a good deal of time talking about um, this man who they were kind of afraid in some ways to go visit because he had kind of crossed into a different world or something and uh, the explanation is there's a fine line between genius and insanity that's my definition of all of us that care about these works and make work is what side of the line are you on? <laughs> and there's a joke about a Polish guy that hits a guy's car. He, the guy gets out, draws a circle. The Polish, he says to the Polish guy, stand in the circle. Polish guy does. He beats the Polish guy's car with a bat. The Polish guy is laughing. He said, I just beat your car up. He said, yeah, but I jumped in and out of the circle three times while you were doing that. <laughs> so maybe that's why we're all here and why we believe in what we're doing. So. But, um. <laughs>